Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So today I will uh, going to discuss about the circulatory system. Now, blood. Blood is basically made up of the plasma and forms elements. Plasma is basically the components are amino acids, nutrients, electrolytes, gases, nitrogenous waste, and proteins. And proteins are basically albumin, fibrinogen, globulin. Formed elements are basically leukocytes that are also called as the WBC or white blood cells. It is basically granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes are neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. And agranulocytes are lymphocytes and monocytes. And formed elements, other parts are platelets and erythrocytes. Erythrocytes is also known as the RBC or red blood cells. Now, the introduction. The branch of science concerned with the study of blood. Blood forming tissues and the disorders associated with them is known as hematology. You have to just break out those words that is hemato, hemato or hema, that is basically blood and logy means study of. So it's a study of the blood. Blood consists of a protein rich fluid known as the plasma in which cellular elements like white blood cells, red blood cells and platelets are suspended. The normal total circulatory blood volume is about 8% of the body weight. 5600 ml in a 70 kg man and about 55% of this volume is plasma. Now you can see that the uh, white blood cells are basically uh, the basophils, eosinophils uh, and neutrophils, monocytes and lymphocytes are there. And uh, neutrophils and monocytes are basically involved in the phagocytosis process. We will discuss later. Now the microscopic view of the blood cells, you can see the, uh, from the uh, image from the uh, scanning electron microscope and also from the light microscopes. So uh, in this image, the white blood cells, that is the leukocyte, neutrophil is there. This one is the blood plasma. And this one is the red blood cells, that is a erythrocyte. This is the platelet. And this is the monocytes. Okay. Next, the functions of blood. Now, the transportation. Blood transports oxygen from the lungs to the cells of the body and carbon dioxide from the body cells to the lungs for exhalation. It carries nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract to body cells and hormones from the endocrine gland to other body cells. Blood also transports heat and waste products to various organs for elimination from the body. Regulation maintain the homeostasis of all the body fluids, regulates the pH through the use of the buffers, adjusts the body temperature through the heat absorbing and cooling properties of the water in blood plasma and its variable rate of flow through the skin where excess heat can be lost from the blood to the environment. In addition, blood osmotic pressure influences the water content of the cells, mainly through the interactions of the dissolved ions and proteins. Protection. So blood can clot, become gel-like, which protects against its excessive loss from the cardiovascular system after an injury. White blood cells are protect against the diseases by carrying on the phagocytosis and we know that the neutrophils and monocytes are 
involved in the phagocytosis procedure. Several types of the blood proteins, including antibodies, interferons, and complement, help to protect against the disease in a variety of ways. Now, the physical characteristics of blood. So, blood is denser and more viscous, thicker than the water, and feels slightly sticky. The temperature of blood is 38, uh, 38 degrees centigrade, that is 100.4 degree Fahrenheit. It has a slightly alkaline pH ranging from 7.35 to 7.45. The color of blood varies with its oxygen content. When saturated with oxygen, it is bright red. When unsaturated with oxygen, it is dark red. Blood volume. So blood volume is 5 to 6 liter in an average sized adult male and 4 to 5 liter in an average sized adult female. The gender difference in Volume is due to differences in body size. Several hormones regulated by negative feedback ensure that the blood volume and osmotic pressure remain relatively constant. Aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone or ADH, regulates how much water is excreted from the urine. Now the components of the circulatory system. Dissolved in the plasma are a large number of proteins, nutrients, metabolic waste, and other molecules being transported between the organ system. The cells are the erythrocytes, that is red blood cells, and leukocytes, that is white blood cells, and the cell fragments are the platelets. More than 99% blood cells are erythrocytes that carry oxygen to the tissues and carbon dioxide from the tissue. The leukocytes protect against the infection and cancer, and the platelets function in blood clot. The constant motion of the blood keeps all the cells dispersed throughout the plasma. Now the hemocrit. So uh, hemocrit is defined as the percentage of blood volume that is erythrocytes. It is measured by the centrifugation, that is spinning at high speeds of a sample of blood. The erythrocytes are formed, uh, forced to the bottom of the centrifuge tube and the plasma remains on the top and the leukocytes and platelets form a very thin layer between them called the puffy coat. You can see that the plasma that are present on the top is only 55%. And puffy coat that are basically less than 1% that are the platelets, that is thrombocytes, as well as white blood cells, that is leukocytes. And in the bottom part, that is red blood cells, erythrocytes are there, that is 45%. The normal hemocrit is approximately 45% in men and 42% in women. Hemocrit of 40 indicates that 40% of the volume of blood is composed of RBCs. This is the simple calculation. And from this calculation, you can uh, uh, actually uh, uh, know the erythrocyte volume as well as the plasma volume also. So the number, volume of blood in a 70 kg person is approximately 5.5 liter. So if we take the hemocrit to be 45%, then erythrocyte volume will be 45%, that means 0 0.45 into 5.5 liter, that is the volume of blood equals to so this multiply would uh, multiply the 0 0.45 into uh, 5.5 liter and you will get the 2.5 liter that is the erythrocyte volume. 
So because the volume occupied by leukocyte and platelets is usually negligible, the plasma volume equals the difference between blood volume and erythrocyte volume. Therefore, in our 70 kg percent plasma volume, 5 liter minus 2.5 subtract the erythrocyte volume and it will get volume. Okay, that is 3 liter. Now the synthesis of erythropoietin. The hormone testosterone present in much higher concentration in males than in females. Stimulates the synthesis of erythropoietin, that is EPO, the hormone that in turn stimulates the production of RBCs. Thus the testosterone contributes to higher hemocrit in the males. A significant drop in hemocrit indicates the anemia, a lower than normal number of the RBCs. In polycythemia, the percentage of RBCs is abnormally high. And the hemocrit may also be 65% or higher. This raises, uh, this raises the viscosity of blood, which increases the resistance to flow and makes the blood more difficult for the heart to pump. Increased viscosity also contributes to the high blood pressure and increased risk of the stroke. Causes of polycythemia include abnormal production, tissue hypoxia, and dehydration. In this case, you can see in this image, the in the hypoxia, when the hypoxia conditions will be there, then the erythropoietin will activate and it produces the red blood cells. And when the red blood cells are produced, then increases the oxygen level and there will be no hypoxia conditions further. Now, the last component that is plasma. Plasma consists of a large number of organic and inorganic substances dissolved in water. The plasma protein constitute most of the plasma solutes by weight and they can be classified into three broad groups that is albumin, lobulin and fibrinogen. The albumins are the most abundant of the three plasma protein groups and are synthesized by the liver. Fibrinogen functions in clotting, that is for the blood clotting, and serum is plasma with no fibrinogen and other proteins. In addition to proteins, plasma contains nutrients, metabolic waste, products and hormones, and a variety of mineral electrolytes, including Na+, K+, and Cl- and others. Now from the stem cells, the megakaryoblast will form, and from the megakaryoblast, megakaryocyte will form, that is the platelet precursor extensions will also form, and then it gives rise to the platelets. Now the substances in blood plasma. So water, that is 91.5% that are present, liquid portion of blood, and what is the function of it? That is basically involved as a solvent and suspending the medium, absorbs, transports, and releases the heat. Plasma proteins, 7%, that is most, mostly produced by the liver. Responsible for the colloid osmotic pressure, major contributors to the blood viscosity, transport hormones, steroids, fatty acids, and calcium, and helps to regulate the blood pH. Albumin is basically smallest and most numerous plasma proteins. And what is the function of it? That is, helps to maintain the osmotic pressure, 
an important factor in the exchange of the fluids across blood capillary walls. Globulin is basically large proteins, that is plasma cells produce the immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins helps attack the viruses and bacteria. Alpha and beta globulin transport the irons, lipids and fat soluble vitamins. Fibrinogen is basically large proteins that are basically plays an important role in the blood clotting. Other solutes are electrolyte, inorganic salts, positively charged cations, that is Na+, plus, K+, plus, Ca2+, plus, Mg2+, plus, and negatively charged, that is anions, Cl-, minus, HBO4-, minus, SO4-, minus, and ACO3-. Minus. Help maintain the osmotic pressure and play an important role in the cell function. Nutrients, so products of digestion such as amino acids, glucose, fatty acids, glycerol, vitamins, and minerals. Essential roles in cell functions, growth, and development. Gases like oxygen is basically involved in the cellular functions. Carbon dioxide is for regulation of blood pH. And regulatory substances like enzyme is basically involved in the catalyze the chemical reactions. Hormones are basically regulate the metabolism, growth, and development. Vitamins is for cofactors for the enzymatic reactions and waste products that is for the urea, uric acid, creatine, creatinine, bilirubin and ammonia. Most are breakdown products of protein metabolism and that are carried by the blood to organs of the excretion. Now the blood cells. All the blood cells are descended from a single population of cells called as the multipotent hematopoietic stem cells, which are undifferentiated cells capable of giving rise to precursors, that is progenitors of any of the different blood cells. When a multipotent stem cell divides, the first branching yields either bone marrow lymphocyte precursor cells which give rise to the lymphocytes or committed stem cells, the progenitor of all the other varieties. Lymphocytes are basically B lymphocyte and T lymphocytes. T lymphocytes are important for uh, cell-mediated uh, responses and B lymphocyte is involved for the humoral responses. The committed stem cells differentiate along only one path, for example, into red blood cells, that is erythrocytes. Now, this chart shows the whole blood is basically 8% and other fluids and tissues is 92% from the body weight. And plasma, uh, whole blood uh, is basically plasma and formed elements. Formed elements is 45% in volume and plasma is 55% only. Uh, and from the plasma, proteins that are 7% is there, water 91.5% and other solutes that is 1.5%. Proteins are like albumin that is present in a highest amount that is 54%, globulin 38%, fibrinogen 7% and all, all other that is 1% only. And other solutes like 1.5% from them, electrolytes, nutrients, gases, regulatory substances, waste products that are there. Now from the formed elements, there are the platelets that is uh, present. White blood cells are also present. White blood cells are basically 5,000 to 10,000. And red Red blood cells, that is 4.8 to 5.4 million cells are there.
white blood cells are basically the neutrophils that are majorly present uh, that is 60 to 70 percent lymphocytes that is 20 to 25 percent monocytes that is 3 to 8 percent and eosinophil that is 2 to 4 percent and basophils that is very low amount 0 0.5 to 1 percent okay so uh, I think the time exceeds. Okay. So, okay, I will cover this hematopoietic stem cells and then uh, the class will end. Okay. Hello. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Hematopoietic stem cells is basically are the bone marrow cells that are capable of producing all types of the blood cell. They differentiate into one or another type of committed stem cells that is progenitor cells. And this in turn form the various differentiated cell types uh, of the blood cells. Okay. And there are separate pools of progenitor cells for the megakaryocytes, lymphocytes, erythrocytes, eosinophil, and basophil. Neutrophil and monocytes arises from the common precursors. The bone marrow stem cells are also the source of osteoclast, copper cells, mast cells, dendritic cells, and Langerhans cells. The HSCs are few in number, but are capable of completing, replacing the bone marrow when injected into a patient whose own bone marrow has been entirely destroyed. The HSCs are derived from uncommitted totipotent stem cells that can be stimulated to form any cell in the body. Adults have a few of these, but they are more readily, uh, readily obtained from the blastoclast or blastocyst of the uh, embryos. Now this one is the HSCs and you can see that so many cells are formed like from the lymphoid cells that is T cells, NK cells that is the natural killer cells, B cells, dendritic cells that are formed from the myeloid, neutrophil, basophil, eosinophil, monocyte, macrophages and dendritic cells are formed and from the erythrocyte megakaryocyte the erythroid megakaryocytes, the erythrocytes and megakaryocytes and platelets are formed. And you have to remember that the dendritic cells are formed from both the cases, that is lymphoid and myeloid, both the cases. Now this is very beautiful picture actually. The pluripotent stem cells is divided into myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. Myeloid stem cells are divided into pro erythroblast megakaryoblast that are the precursor cells or blast and it gives rise to the reticulocyte red blood cells and megakaryoblast is give rise to the megakaryocyte that are basically form the platelets and see uh, if you gm that is called as the colony forming unit granulocyte make a macrophages so eosinophil may myeloblast is there so from the, this, eosinophil is formed, basophilic myeloblast from there, basophil myeloblast from there, the neutrophil monoblast to monocyte, and from the lymphoid stem cell, T lymphoblast, that is T cells or T lymphocyte is formed, and B lymphoblast, that is B lymphocyte or B cells will form, and from the NK lymphoblast there the natural killer cells or NK cells will form. Okay. Stem cells are specialized human cells that are able to develop into many different cell types. Stem cells have a critical role in a variety of tissues. Some important properties are there. Like terminally differentiated that is it is not 
at the end of a pathway of the differentiation. It can divide without limit or at least for the lifetime of the animals. When it divides, each daughter has a choice. It can either remain a stem cells, that is basically for the stem cells, self-renewal properties to increase its own cells or mother cells, or it can embark on a course that commits it to terminal differentiation. So stem cells are required whenever or wherever there is a recurring need to replace the differentiated cells that cannot themselves divide. Although a stem cell must be able to divide, it does not necessarily have to divide rapidly. In fact, many stem cells divide at a relatively slow rate. Stem cells are of many types, specialized for the genesis of different classes of terminally differentiated cells, like intestinal stem cells for intestinal epithelium, epidermal stem cells for epidermis, hematopoietic stem cells, as I have already mentioned in my previous classes about the hematopoietic stem cells for the blood, and so on. Each daughter produced when a stem cell divide can either remain a stem cell or go on to become terminally differentiated. In many cases, the daughter that opt for terminal differentiation undergoes additional cell divisions before terminal differentiation is completed. Such cells are called as the transit amplifying cells. You can see in this picture that the stem cells are divided into the two daughter cells, and one is for its self renewal properties to increase its own cells, that is the stem cells. Basically, it is basically in order to remain its own state uh, and remain its own numbers is uh, basically same. And another one is basically for the differentiation. And after the differentiation is completed, then it is basically involved in the terminally differentiated form. Two ways for a stem cell to produce the daughters with different facts, uh, fits, that is asymmetric cell division. Another one is the independent choice. So what is asymmetric cell division? The asymmetric division strategy gives a clone consisting of precisely one stem cell plus a steadily increasing number of differentiating cells in proportion to the number of the cell divisions. Asymmetric cell divisions is basically, this is basically the localized and determinant, and this is the stem cells. So when it divides, as I mentioned earlier, that one is for the self renewal case, and another one is for the its own properties. And uh, this is the possible outcomes. That is, after first division of cell of the stem cells, after second division of the stem cells of so first division, one terminally uh, differentiated cells will form. After the second division, two terminally uh, differentiated cells will form. And the choice determined by the asymmetry in dividing the stem cells. So, in this manner, the continual process is involved and the stem cells is divided into the asymmetric form. Second form is basically the independent choice. The independent choice strategy is more variable in its outcome. With a choice made at random by each daughter, and with a 50% possibility or probability for each one to remain a stem cell or differentiate, there is, for example, a 25% chance at the first division that both the daughters will differentiate so that the clone eventually goes extinct. You can see in this picture that the cells are divided into the two daughter cells 
and this is basically environmental factor that basically help to determine the cell fate that what cell types will form and then the terminal differentiated cells will also there now you can see that after the first division of the stem cells two daughter cells are produced the, uh, either it has a two daughter cells or it has one daughter cells and one terminally differentiated cells another choice is two terminally differentiated cells so in that manner you can see in the second division cell cycle then many cells are daughters and for, uh, almost a 50% is uh, daughter stem cells and 50% is the terminal cells stem cells in the second choice you can see only few are basically the daughter stem cells and many are the terminally differentiated stem cells and in the third choice you can see that all the stem cells are basically terminally differentiated ones so this is this is the choice determined the uh, uh, stochastic uh, stochastically and or by the environment hematopoiesis as i have uh, earlier discussed uh, this chapter that is the hematopoiesis how it happened hematopoietic stem cells how it uh, give rise to the uh, nk cells or uh, t cells b cells etc so basically what is that the multipotent stem cells normally divides infrequently to differentiate either more multipotent stem cells which are self renewing or committed progenitor cells which are limited in the number of the times that they can divide before differentiating to form a mature blood cells as they go through their divisions the progenitors become progressively some special or more specialized in the range of cell types that they can give rise to as indicated by the branching of the cell lineage diagram in adult man, uh, mammals all of the cells shown develop mainly in the bone marrow except for the t lymphocytes which are indicated de uh, and develop in the thymus macrophages and osteoblast which develop from the blood monocytes some dendritic cells may also derive from monocytes so this is the multipotent hematopoietic stem cells you can see and it basically generate into the multipotent hematopoietic progenitor cells common lymphoid precursor or progenitor cells and common myeloid progenitor cells and common uh, myeloid progenitor cells is basically granulocyte or macrophages progenitor another one is the megakaryocyte erythroid progenitor from the megakaryocyte or erythroid progenitor it give rise to the erythroblast and erythroblast give rise to the erythrocytes second one is basically involved for the megakaryocyte and megakaryocyte from this platelets is formed second one is the granulocyte macrophage progenitor cells macrophage dendritic cell precursor is formed and which give rise to the monocyte and from the monocyte macrophage will form another one is the dendritic cells dendritic cells and macrophages are basically involved in the immune systems another one is the neutrophil eosinophil basophil another one is the mast cells mast cells is also involved in the immune system so common lymphoid precursors is basically the natural killer t cell precursors natural killer or t cell precursors basically give rise to the t cells and natural killer cells so natural killer cells also uh in fault in the immune systems 
and thymus from the thymus it gave rise to the two types one is the t cells another one is the b cells t cells is involved in the cell mediated immune responses and b cells is basically involved in the humoral immune responses from the b cells it gave rise to the plasma cells and from the plasma cells we know the antibodies is produced now some of the parameters through which the production of blood cells of a specialized type might be regulated studies in culture suggest that various colony stimulating factors that is cf uh, csfs can affect all of these aspects of the hematopoiesis now you can see that this one the stem cells is basically this is the controllable parameter basically first is frequency of stem cells division second thing is probability of stem cell death and third is the probability that the stem cell daughter will become a comitate progenitor cell of the given type so these are the factors that are basically involved after that the committed progenitor cells will form and this is basically involved to produce one terminally differentiated cells and one daughter cells so the division cycle time of committed progenitor cells probability of progenitor cell death third one is basically involved differentiated the committed progenitor cell as divisions better and after that the terminally differentiated blood cells will form that is the lifetime of differentiated cells now the production of differentiated cells from the es that is embryonic stem cells and ips that is induced pluripotent stem cells in the culture so these cells can be cultured indefinitely as the pluripotent cells when attached as a monolayer to a dish you can see here the cultured es that is embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells and then after this culture the embryoid body will form that is about 1000 cells now they are give rise to various cell types you can see here so alternatively they can be detached and allowed to form the aggregate called as the embryoid bodies which causes the cells to begin to specialize so cells from the embryoid bodies cultured in a media with different factors added can then be driven or driven to the differentiate in various ways as you can see in the first case what happens if we treat it with a retionic acids insulin and thyroid hormone then it give rise to the adipocyte stem cells second one if we just treated with the retinoic acid then the neuron cells will form or neurons will form if we treated with the macrophage colony stimulating factor that i have mentioned earlier the colony stimulating factors for this that interleukin 3 and interleukin 1 then it give rise to the macrophages if we just give Uh, the retinoic acid along with the di butyryl cmp then it give rise to the smooth muscle cell and if there only the three conditions will be given that is fibroblast growth factor fibroblast growth factor 2 epidermal growth factor fibroblast growth factor 2 and platelet derived growth factor then it give rise to the astrocytes and oligodendrocytes applications of stem cells so now the cells taken from the inner cell mass 
of an early mammalian embryo can be propagated in culture indefinitely in a pluripotent state when transplanted back into a host early embryo these embryonic stem cells that is es cells can contribute cells to any tissues including the germline cells what is germline and what is the somatic cell line germline cells are uh, called as the uh, is basically the sex cells that is sperms and the embryos and any body part except this is called as the somatic cell line so here we uh, see there the germline stem cells is mentioned embryonic cells have been invaluable for genetic engineering in mice cells with similar properties called as the induced pluripotent stem cells can be generated from the adult differentiated cells such as the fibroblast by forced expression of a cocktail of key transcription regulators a similar method can be used to reprogram the adult cells different or uh, directly from one specialized state to another and in principle the ips that is induced pluripotent stem cells can generate from the cells biops from an adult human patient could be used for the tissue repair in that same individual avoiding the problem of the immune rejection more immediately they provide a source of specialized cells that can be used to analyze in vitro the effects of the mutations affecting the human cells and for screening for the drugs for the treatment of the genetic diseases now the basic concepts about the stem cells a bone marrow transplant is the replacement of cancerous or abnormal red bone marrow with a healthy red bone marrow in order to establish the normal blood cell counts a more recent advance for obtaining the stem cells involves a cord blood transplant it is very important the cord blood transplant and it is most advanced that are basically uh, nowadays uh, this is the most advanced process the connection between the mother and the embryo and later the fetus is the umbilical cord the stem cells may be obtained from the um, umbilical cord shortly after the birth the stem cells are removed from the cord with a syringe and then frozen so stem cells from the cord have several advantages over those obtained from the red bone marrow what are these they are easily collected following the permission of the newborn parents second they are more abundant than the stem cells in the red bone marrow third they are less likely to cause the graft versus host disease so the match between the donor and recipient does not have to be as close as in a bone marrow transplant and this provide a larger number of potential donors it's a very important point the graft versus host disease this is very important they are less likely to transmit the infections they can be stored indefinitely in the cord blood banks now the hemostasis so hemostasis is a sequence of responses that stops bleeding the hemostasis and homeostasis is different okay 
the hemostasis is basically the responses that stops the bleeding when the blood vessels are damaged or ruptured the homeostasis or hemostasis response must be quick localized to the region of damage and carefully controlled in order to be effective three mechanisms reduce the blood loss first one is the vascular spasm second one is the platelet plug formation and third one is the blood clotting or coagulation hemostasis prevent the hemorrhage what is hemorrhage hemorrhage is a loss of a large amount of blood from the vessels so hemostatic mechanism can prevent the hemorrhage from smaller blood vessels but extensive hemorrhage from the large vessels usually requires the medical intervention now vascular spasm so when the arteries or arterioles are damaged the circularly arranged smooth muscle in their walls contracts immediately a reaction called as the vascular spasm this reduces the blood loss from or for several minutes to several hours during which time the other hemostatic mechanism go into the operation the spasm is probably caused by the damage to the smooth muscle by substances released from the activated platelets and by reflexes initiated by the pain receptors now the summary of the reactions involving hemostasis so injury to a blood vessel exposes the collagen and thromboplastin recruiting platelets to the site of the injury to form a temporary plug so platelets release 5 hydroxy uh, tryptamine that is among other factors and resulting in the smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction activation of the clotting cascade in response to collagen and thromboplastin activates the thrombin and which converts the circulating fibrinogen to fibrin monomers and fibrin monomers polymerize and are cross linked and accumulate with the platelets at the site of the injury to form the defi uh, definitive clot you can see in this picture that the vessel injury will occur and platelet recruitment will be there and vessel constriction will be there and the collagen thromboplastin is also involved so activation of the clotting factors thrombo thrombin thrombin is basically fibrinogen to fibrin will form and it basically involved for the hemostasis process now the platelet plug formation okay i will take uh, only the 5 minutes okay and then i will end my class okay now considering their small size platelets store an impressive array of chemicals within many vesicles are clotting factors like adp atp ca2 plus means calcium and serotonin also present some enzymes that produce that is thromboxin a2 a prostaglandin fibrin stabilizing factor which helps to strengthen the blood clot lysosomes some mitochondria and membrane systems that take up and store the calcium and provide the channels to for the release of the contents of the granules and glycogen 
also within the platelets is platelet de de derived growth factors that is pdgf is in also very important in that case so what is pdgf pd pdgf a hormone that can cause the proliferation of vascular endothelial cells vascular smooth muscle fibers and fibroblast to help repair the damaged blood vessel walls some important steps are there initially the platelets contact and stick to parts of a damaged blood vessel such as the collagen fiber of the connective tissue underlying the damaged endothelial cells and this process is called as the platelet adhesion so you can see in this picture that uh, this is the red blood cells and this is the platelets and here you can see that the collagen fibers are damaged endothelium this is the collagen fibers and this is the damaged endothelium so this is basically the platelet adhesion second one is basically the platelet release reaction so due to adhesion the platelet become activated and their character characteristics change dramatically they extend many projections that enable them to contact and interact with one another and they begin to liberate the contents of the uh, blood vessels and this phase is called as the platelet released reaction you can see here this is the collagen fibers and this is basically the uh, liberated uh, adp serotonin and thromboxin a2 etc so liberated adp and thromboxin a2 plays a major role by activating the nearby platelets so they are basically involved for the activation of the platelets and serotonin and thromboxin 2 uh, thromboxin a2 that function as a vasoconstriction causing and sustaining the construction of the vascular muscle uh, smooth muscle and which decreases the blood flow through the injured vessels you can see in this picture now the platelet aggregation so the release of the adp makes other platelets in the area stickly and the stickiness of the newly recruited and activated platelets causes them to adhere to the originally activated platelets and this gathering of platelets is called as the platelet aggregation now eventually the accumulation of and the attachment of the large number of platelets form a mass that is called as the platelet plug you can see in this picture this is the platelet plug so more numbers of platelets are there to form a plug like structure and a plug platelet plug is very effective very effective in the preventing the blood loss in a small vessel so although initially the platelet plug is loose it becomes quite tight when reinforced by the fibrin threads formed during the clotting a platelet plug can stop the blood loss completely if the hole in the blood vessel is not too large so you can see in this picture this is the collagen fibers and this is basically the platelet uh, plug that are formed now in the blood clotting normally the blood remains in its liquid form as long as it stays within its vessels if it is drawn from the body however it thickens 
and form a gel eventually the gel separates from the liquid the straw colored liquid called as a serum is simply the blood plasma minus the clotting factor so serum is basically the blood plasma minus the clotting factor so here no clotting factor is present the gel is called as a blood clot or blood coagulation it consists of a network of insoluble protein fibers called as a fibrin in which the formed elements of blood are trapped and this process of gel formation called as a clotting or coagulation and it is a series of chemical reactions that culminates the formation of fibrin threads if the blood clots too easily the result can be thrombosis so what is the meaning of the thrombosis thromb means clot and osis means a condition of so it is a clotting in an undamaged blood vessels if the blood takes too long to clot hemorrhage can occur you can see in this picture that this is the blood vessels where the red blood cells as well as the white blood cells and platelets are present and in the next session you can see that the fibrin there the thread like structures is formed and this is how it's uh, the blood clot will occur now the blood clot formation so clotting involves several substances known as the clotting or coagulation factors these factors include the calcium ions that is ca2 plus ions several inactive enzymes that are synthesized by the hepatocytes or liver cells and released into the blood stream and various molecules associated with the platelets are released by the dermis tissues most clotting factors are identified by the roman numericals like 1 2 3 4 like that that indicate the order of their discovery not necessarily always remember it is not necessarily the order of their participation in the clotting process the clotting is a complex cascade of enzymatic reaction in which each clotting factor activates many molecules of the next one in a fixed sequence and finally a large quantity of the product the insoluble protein fibrin is formed you can see in this first image that is basically for the early stage you can see that the platelet is present red blood cells is also present and this is the fibrin thread but it is very low amount that are present in the intermediate stage there you can see the fibrin thread it is more than the earlier stages but in the next stage that is the late stage showing the red blood cells that are trapped you can see that this one is trapped in a fibrin thread so here the fibrin threads are more or in a huge amount that are basically involved for the clot formation and notice that the platelet and red blood cells entrapped in the fibrin threads okay this is very important point that the platelets and the red blood cells are entrapped in the fibrin threads in the next uh, slide we can see that the clotting can be divided into the three stages first two pathways that are basically involved first one is the clot, uh, extrinsic pathway second one is the intrinsic pathway which will be described shortly led to the information of the thrombo prothrombinase once the prothrombinase is formed the steps involved in the next two stages of clotting are the same for both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways and together these two stages are refer are referred as the common pathway prothrombinase converts the prothrombin a plasma protein formed by the liver into the enzyme thrombin 
and thrombin converts the soluble fibrinogen that is another plasma protein that are formed by the liver into the insoluble fibrin and fibrin forms the thread of the clot you can see in this diagram that this one is basically the platelet this is you can see that red blood cells are there and this is the damaged or broken blood vessels okay so in the next image you can see that the clot is formed right in that manner clot is formed this yellow colored thread like structure is called as a fibrin and this one is the activated platelet that are important now the extrinsic pathway so the extrinsic pathway of blood clotting has fewer steps than the intrinsic pathway and occurs rapidly within a matter of seconds if the trauma is severe it is so named because a tissue protein called as the tissue factor also called as the tf also known as the thromboplasty that leaks into the blood from the cells outside that is extrinsic to the blood vessels and initiates the formation of the prothrombin and this tissue factor is a complex mixture of the lipoproteins and phospholipids that are released from the surface of the damaged cells in the presence of ca2 plus or calcium the tissue factor begins a sequence of reactions that ultimately activates the clotting factor 10 that is once the factor 10 is activated it combines with the factor 5 that is clotting factor 5 and in the presence of the ca2 plus that is calcium to form the active enzyme prothrombin and completing the extrinsic pathway so the main part is uh, in this image is basically the activation of the prothrombinase how it is possible when the tissue trauma happens then the tissue factor is basically uh, activated and tissue factors in the presence of the calcium and tissue factor they are activated x or activated 10 that is uh, clotting factor 10 is basically involved and activated uh, clotting factor 10 with the presence of the clotting factor 5 in the presence of the calcium then the prothrombinase will be activated now the intrinsic pathway you can see here also the prothrombinase is activated so both the procedure is specifically involved for the activation of the prothrombinase that is very important point now how it is happening the intrinsic pathway of blood clotting is more complex than the extrinsic pathway and it occurs more slowly usually requiring several minutes but extrinsic process is quick uh, uh, is happen in a quick manner or very uh, fastly but the intrinsic process is more slowly process the intrinsic pathway is so named because its activators are either in direct contact with the blood or contain within or intrinsic to the blood outside the tissue damage is not needed if the endothelial cells become roughened or damaged blood can come in contact with the collagen fibers in the connective tissue around the endothelia of the blood vessel in addition trauma to the endothelial cells causes the damage to the platelets and resulting in the release of the phospholipids by the platelets you can see in this image this one is basically the damaged endothelial cells exposes the collagen fibers and this one is the damaged platelets now the in the next step contact with the collagen fibers that all with the glass slides of a blood collection tube activates the clotting factor 12 which begins a sequence of reaction 
that eventually activates the clotting factor 10. You can see that the activation of plus 12, then the, C, the presence of CH2 plus, they are the activated 10. Clotting factor 10 is involved. Now, the platelet phospholipids, this one, and the CH2 plus, that is calcium, also participate in the activation of the factor 10. Now, once the factor 10 is activated, it combines with the factor 5, this one, to form the active enzyme that is called as the prothrombinase. And just as occurs in the extrinsic pathway, completing the intrinsic pathway also. Now, you can see that the, both the procedure is basically uh, important for the prothrombinase activation. So, the process is different, but both are activated the prothrombinase. You can see in this following diagram. Now the common pathway. So after the prothrombinase formation, there the common pathway is involved. Now the formation of prothrombinase marks the beginning of the common pathway. In the second stage of blood clotting, Prothrombinase and calcium, you can see that the prothrombinase and calcium is basically involved. That catalyzes the conversion of the prothrombin to thrombin. Okay, this one. In the third stage, thrombin in the presence of the calcium converts the fibrinogen and which is soluble to lose the fibrin threads, which are insoluble. Now, when the thrombin also activates the factor 30, that is the fibrin stabilizing factor, and which threatens and stabilizes the fibrin threads into a sturdy clot. Now, the plasma proteins contains, or plasma contains, some common uh, factors like uh, 30 which is also released by the platelets trapped in the clot. Now, thrombin has two positive feedback effects. In the first positive feedback loop, which involves the factor 5, it accelerates the formation of the prothrombinase. And prothrombinase, in turn, accelerates the function or production of more thrombin and so on. In the second positive feedback loop, thrombin activates the platelets, which reinforces their aggregation and the release of the platelet phospholipids. You can see that from the prothrombin, calcium factor in the presence of calcium factor, thrombin is activated, and thrombin there with the help of the calcium factors, uh, fibrinogen is basically involved. Now, fibrinogen that loses, at first this loses the fibrin threads and factor 13, then activated when it's converted to the activated factor 13, then it threatens the fibrin threads. So, this is the common pathway. Now, the clot retraction. Once a clot is formed, it plugs the ruptured area of the blood vessels and thus stop the blood loss. Clot retraction is the consolidation or tightening of the fibrin clot. The fibrin threads attach to the damaged surfaces of the blood vessel gradually contract as the platelet pull on them. As the clot retracts, it pulls the edges of the damaged vessel closer together and decreasing the risk of the further damage. Now, during the retraction, some serum can escape between the fibrin threads, but the formed elements in the blood cannot. Now, normal its retraction depends on an adequate number of the platelets in the clot, and which release the factor 13 and other factors thereby strengthening and stabilizing the clot and permanent repair of the blood vessel can then take place. 
in time fibroblast form the connective tissue in the ruptured area and new endothelial cells repair and vessel lining occur now the role of vitamin k in clotting you know that the vitamin k is a derivative of naphthoquinone okay naphthoquinone and the vitamin k there are two types of the vitamin k is basically uh, very important that is vitamin k1 and vitamin k2 vitamin k1 is also known as the phytoquinone and vitamin k2 is also known as the menaquinone so normal clotting is depends on the adequate levels of the vitamin k in the body Although vitamin K is not involved in actual clot formation, it is required for the synthesis of four clotting factors. Normally produced by the bacteria that inhibit the large intestine, vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin, and that can be absorbed through the lining of the intestine and into the blood. if absorption of lipids is normal people suffering from disorders that slow the absorption of the lipids for example inadequate release of bile into the intestine often experience a uncontrolled bleeding as a consequence of the vitamin k deficiency so vitamin k is basically have an important role in the clotting factors or in the clotting process now these are basically the blood clotting factors always remember that the six is absent here so you can write from 1 to 13 but six is not be there so 1 to 5 and 7 to 13 factors are there so at first factor basically first factor is basically the fibrinogen second one is prothrombin third one is thromboplastin fourth one is very important that is calcium fifth one is pro acylarin label factor and acylarator globulin six is not there now the seventh one seventh one is basically pro converting is pca and stable factor now eight is basically anti hemophilic factor anti hemophilic factor a and anti hemophilic globulin factor 9 is basically plasma thromboplastin component or schismus factor anti hemophilic factor b 10 is basically stuart power uh, power factor that is stuart power factor 11th one is plasma thromboplastin antecedent that is pta or anti hemophilic factor c 12th one is hegman factor or glass factor 13th one is fibrin stabilizing factor A lucky Lauren factor. Now another some important factors are there, but but that is not so much important as like one to thirty. Okay, that are like other factors are basically like H M W K that is high molecular weight kininogen or Pitt Jardel's factor, pre K A that is pre calicrin. or fletcher factor and ka is basically calicrin and pl is basically platelet phospholipid you can also make some mnemonics for better remembering this uh, chart because it's uh, very difficult to remember all the names so you can make uh, by your own that some re uh, remembering methods are there uh, some mnemonics is also there okay now this is very important chart that are basically for the sources and the pathways that are involved for the activation process of the blood clotting factors now you can remember like this that is liver 
So the source's labor is for factor three and four. Platelets is for factor three, four, five, and thirteen. Common factors that are involved for the one, two, and thirteen factors. Intrinsic factors are basically involved for eight, nine, eleven, and twelve. Extrinsic pathway is basically involved for three and seven. And all factors uh, or all the pathways, like common pathways, extrinsic pathways, as well as the intrinsic pathways, that are basically for the calcium ions, like four factor four. And extrinsic plus intrinsic is for the five and ten. So it is also very important the sources and the pathways of activation. You have to remember this. And also remember that this one, that is a platelet, is basically for the three, four, five, and thirty. Now the process of blood clotting. So in this diagram, you can see that the this one is uh, in the first image. That is, this one is the normal blood vessels there. No injured or damaged blood vessels is there. So it is a normal form. So when the blood Vessels is injured or damaged. Then what happens? Now the platelet plug formation will occur. And when the platelet plug formation occurs, then the form this one is uh, so blood is basically uh, released from this case. But in the last step, you can see that the blood is no, uh, no releases of the blood and the blood uh, clot formation is. Totally successfully occur. Now the anti-clotting mechanisms. This is also very important. The tendency of blood to clot is balanced in vivo by the reactions that prevent the clotting inside the blood vessels and break down any clots that do form or both. These reactions include. The interaction between the platelet aggregating effect of thromboxin A2 and the anti-aggregating factor of prostaglyce uh, prostacycline, which causes the clots to form at the site when a blood vessel is injured, but keeps the blood vessel lumen free of the clot. Now the anti-thrombin three. It is a circulatory protease inhibitor that binds to the serine proteases in the coagulation system and blocks their activity as the clotting factors. This binding is facilitated by the heparin, a naturally occurring anticoagulant, and that is a mixture of the sulfated. Polysaccharides. It's a very important, uh, naturally occurring anticoagulant uh, is basically heparin. The clotting factors that are inhibited are the active forms of factor nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Now, some of the examples of the diseases due to the deficiency of the clotting factors. So. For the deficiency of factor one, is basically for the aprinogenemia because the name of the uh, clotting factor is basically fibrinogen. So when it is not present or when it is absent, then the clinical symptoms will be there. That is like a fibrinogenemia causes like. Depletion during the pregnancy with the premature separation of the placenta, also congenital, that is rareness. Second factor that is basically prothrombin. So when it is not present, then hypoprothrombinemia is formed or occur. That is basically hemorrhage tendency in the liver disease. And what is the causes for it? That is basically the decreased hepatic 
synthesis usually secondary to the vitamin k deficiency factor 5 that is basically we know that the pro acid ring that are basically involved so in the absence of the pro acid ring there the para hemophilia is formed and it is a congenital disorder factor 7 that is basically pro converting that are basically basically involved factor but when it is absent then the hypoconverting anemia is formed or occur and it is also a congenital disorder now factor 8 it is very important that is hemophilia a is formed that is the classic hemophilia that are basically formed so factor 8 is basically anti hemophilic factors or anti hemophilic factor a so when it is not present then the hemophilia a or hemophilia disorder is formed and what are the causes basically congenital defect due to the various abnormalities of the gene on the x or the uh, chromosome that codes for the factor 8 this is is there or inherited as a sex linked characteristics now factor 9 it's also important that is hemophilia b is involved that is also called as the christmas disease it is also a congenital disorder factor 9 is basically the christmas factor or plasma thromoplastin or anti hemophilic factor b so when it is absent then hemophilia b is involved or hemophilia b will occur factor 10 that is known as stuart factor or prover factor or thrombokinase so in the absence of it stuart power factor this deficiency or disorder will form and it is also a congenital disorders now now factor 11 factor 11 is basically plasma thromboplastin antecedent or anti hemophilic factor c so when it is absent then pta deficiency will form and it is also a congenital disorder now the factor 12 factor 12 is known as hegemon factor or glass factor or contract factor or anti hemophilic factor d so in the absence of this factors there the hegemon trait disorder will form and it is also a congenital disorder i already exit with the time so that's all for today session anticoagulants is also a very vast chapter so i will not complete it within this next time so that's all for today session thank you so much for listening me and